There sits a lake nestled within the rolling green hills of Llyn Barfog, just to the back of Abadovi, where once a band of beautiful fairies known as the Gragath Anon made their home. Dusk would draw in and the ladies would appear dressed all in green, and with their milk-white hounds they would tend to their most prized possessions, a herd of beautiful alabaster cows. And these cows had not gone unnoticed by a particular farmer whose land bordered the lake, nor had the fact that one of the cows of the lake had fallen in love with a bull in his herd, and came visiting nightly to gaze into each other's big cattly eyes. After weeks of plotting, one night the farmer seized the moment of opportunity and captured the white cow as she trotted over to his gate and placed her amongst his own herd. From that day, the farmer's fortunes grew exponentially. Everything the white cow produced was unsurpassed by any cow in all of Wales. Her calves were strong and healthy, and her cheese, butter and milk were as delicious as fairy wine. The fame of the cow was spread across all the kingdoms. The farmer, now fat and with wits dulled by his years of wealth, began to think, without any real evidence to support such a notion, that the fey cow was probably getting old, and that it was time to fatten her up ready for slaughter. Oh, and fatten she did, to the point where no one in living memory could remember seeing a cow so magnificently large. Oh, she was the fattest cow you could ever believe. So round, practically spherical, horrifying. The day of the slaughter came around, and before the butcher had even arrived, the farmer was counting his takings. Since there wasn't much to do in these days, people began gathering from all the neighbouring counties to watch this great beast meet its end. As the butcher parted the crowd, rolling up his shirt sleeves to bear his beastly red right arm, a hush fell over those in attendance. The cow, now tethered, bowed her head, and her pleading, mournful eyes met the butcher's. But this butcher had work to do. And with such an eager crowd, he decided to bust out his most extravagant method of slaughter, raising his bludgeon to the sky before striking fair and true between the cow's eyes. But the moment the blow struck, a piercing shriek ran out, awakening the echoes of the hills. The weapon flew out of his hand and knocked over a dozen men standing near, while the butcher was sent careening wildly through the air like a sycamore spinner. The farmer began staggering up, and once he was on all fours, he noticed that the crowd was now looking out to the lake. Standing on a high crag above, a lady clad in green cried out in a voice loud and clear, Come yellow, yellow anvil, anvil, stray, stray horns, horns, speckled, speckled one, of one of the lake, and of the and hornless of the horn doddlin, doddlin, arise, come, come home. home. And with that, the white cow slipped through its tether as if it were never there, and with every step shed the weight that the farmer had forced her to endure. Once she reached the edge of the lake, she looked as young as the day that the farmer had stolen her away, and she began stepping up into the air, rising until she was level with the crag that her fairy companion had called her to. Presently, the cow's entire herd, her children, her children's children, and even their child, began walking out of the farmer's fields and into the air to meet their mother. Only one of the farmer's herd remained, and even she had turned from milky white to raven black. But she was actually the first of the Welsh black cattle, so that's nice. Seeing his prospects quite literally up in the air, he staggered about his farm, letting out the most pitiful cries, at times cursing the fairies and at others pleading desperately with them. Eventually, having realised that he was truly a disgraced man, he threw himself into the lake where he drowned, while the Gragath Anon watched, laughing imperiously from atop their crag. Welcome, one and all, and let me tell you a tale of gods and goblins, a podcast exploring the bizarre and beautiful world of British mythology, folklore, and fairy tales. We will share tales of fearsome giants, valiant heroes, witches and wizards, ghosts and ghouls, and fantastical flora and fauna. But in this, our first series, we are continuing to look at the fairies of the British Isles. But first, let's introduce ourselves. Hello, my name is Heather Morehouse. I am going to be mostly narrating. And I have with me a little goblin sitting in a little goblin chair. And his name is Kieran Hill. <laughs> How the devil are you, Kieran? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. It's a beautiful day today. It is. Um, 
It's a bank holiday. Yes, a bank holiday Monday. Another bank holiday. Wow, there have been so many recently. And all completely wasted. All absolutely worthless. Except this one, because we're recording. That's true, we're making good use of it. That's good. How was your week? How was my week? Your fortnight, in fact. Absolutely fine. Full <laughs> of gods and goblins. Come for the stories, stay for the banter. I'm excited, currently, to tell the world, the people who are listening, our beautiful listeners, about our next topic. And we're talking about fairies in relation to the landscape where fairies live, where they dwell in the dingles and hingles and hills of Britain. Hingles aren't a thing, but dingles are, apparently. I think it's going to be quite fun. We have managed to make this our longest piece of research yet. I don't know how this keeps happening. We had this concept that the episodes would be like 15, 20 minutes long and we're already getting up to an hour. How many pages of notes did you say we've made? We, in total, our document for the fairy series is 48 pages long. We've written a book. We've got a lot here, so I think we should probably get cracking. Let's do it. In some areas of fairy lore, the places that they inhabit are ways to explain certain aspects of the British landscape that were mysterious and magical to folk. And so, into those gaps in understanding, the wee folk creep. And soon they dance, too. Some of the clearest examples of this would be fairy rings. These are the dark rings in grass that sprout into toadstools in late summer and autumn, and were believed to be caused by fairies dancing in circles. They're actually caused by fungus, forming structures beneath the grass that spread out in a circle, dying out in the centre first until a ring of live fungus continues. In undisturbed patches of grass, fairy rings can expand by 30 centimetres a year and live for centuries. Do you remember that show, The Magic of Mushrooms, that we watched with that lovely old scientist man? <gasps> it was so good. Save BBC Four. Oh my God, yes. Actually, that's a good point, people. I'm going to put the link to the position to save BBC Four in the description for this podcast because it's the best TV channel and it's where Lucy Worsley lives, my personal icon. And I need it to stay. So BBC4, if you don't know, is basically the BBC channel that has all the art and history documentaries that you could possibly ever want. It's really wonderful. Also, if you're looking for two young, sprightly presenters to host uh, a documentary about mythology in Britain, right? I don't think they're listening. You never know who's going to listen. That's a good point. Hello, the Queen. <laughs> Heather Morehouse, Prince Charles Stan. I am a stan of no monarch. Here's a quote from Wirt Sykes. <laughs> I feel like this is just the way to transition in any conversation <laughs> at this point in time. The circles in the fairy grass. No, I just put fairy. <laughs> the fairy grass of the fairy fields. No. In the fairy hills, near the fairy sky. In the fairy glade. Oh, the fairy glade. Okay. <clears throat> The circles in the grass of green fields, which are commonly called fairy rings, are numerous in Wales, and it is deemed just as well to keep out of them, even in our day. This was written in 1880. Yes, I have memorised the date that this book came out. Lockdown's doing strange things to all of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's doing good things for me. <laughs> the peasantry no longer believe that the fairies can be seen dancing there, nor that the cap of invisibility will fall on the head of one who enters the circle. But they do believe that the fairies, in a time not long gone, made these circles with the tread of their tripping feet, and that some misfortune will probably befall any person intruding upon this forbidden ground. The prophet Edmund Jones of the Tranche was noted in Monmouthshire in the first years of the 19th century for his fervent piety and his large credulity with regard to the fairies and all other goblins. He held that the Bible alludes to fairies, quoting Matthew 12.43. He says that... The scripture saith that the walk of evil spirits is in dry places and that fairies dance in circles in dry places. So they're definitely evil spirits. But surely things good or evil really only dance in dry places. You, you've not listened to Ricky Martin. She makes you take your shoes off and go dancing in the rain. Why would you take any bit of clothing off in the rain? Or is it take your clothes off? Take your shoes off. <laughs> he also claimed that they favour oak trees due to the deep shade that they offer, mm -hmm. and because druids liked them. Put it all together. So it was dangerous to chop down oak trees in fair, dry places, lest a mysterious aching pain claim their lives. But it's not all doom and gloom. The Welsh sheep, it is affirmed, are the only beasts which will eat the grass that grows in the fairy rings. 
All other creatures avoid it. But the sheep eat it greedily, hence the superiority of Welsh mutton over any mutton in the wide world. I like that this is a link between a lot of stories we've been looking at. If they're from Wales, they almost always end with, and that's why X animal from Wales is better than all the other animals. There's quite a fun little detail about fairy rings in The Good People, New Fairy Law Essays by Margaret Bennett, who recorded that in Balcuhida in the Scottish Highlands, it was believed that fairies would use the mushrooms of fairy rings as seats and dinner tables. Oh, I know. Instead of the knights of the round table, you have the little fairies of the round table sitting on their little toadstools. We also have explanations for the earthworks that we see around the British Isles too. The Dana O'Shee, which we discussed in the last episode, are the fairy race of Ireland, descended from the mythical and fabulous Tuatha de Danann. And they take their name from the mounds that they came to reside in. She meaning mound or hill. These prehistoric hill forts and ring forts and other such earthworks are most prevalent in the Celtic areas of Britain, Cornwall, Wales and Ireland, and are raised or walled defensive structures that were likely built in the Bronze and Iron Ages, which is around roughly a thousand years BCE. I love how many times fairies are just giving credit to this stuff that like people's ancestors from like two generations back had done. How long do you think a generation is? Who's to say? So a lot of the stories that we have are recorded between sort of 1700 and 1900. <laughs> and these were built a thousand years BCE. Are you mixing up a generation with a millennia? I no. A millennium, rather. No. No? Okay, well, they were from quite a long time ago. And I've got to say, when you look at pictures of these hill forts in the landscape, the way that the grass has like grown over the structures they do look really quite magical and weird so yeah i would say you know without you know geophys without time <laughs> <laughs> without time team to help you out and you know you're a superstitious farmer in 1755 you look at this and you're like what is that yeah if only tony robinson was here to help me there's a quote here from o curry in Lectures on Manuscript Materials, published in Dublin, 1861. And he says, The term she, as far as we know it, is applied in old writings to the palaces, courts, halls, or residences of those beings which, in ancient Gaelic mythology, held the place which ghosts, phantoms, and fairies hold in the superstitions of the present day. So the place that they come from, their dwellings, are, in this case, extremely important to their kind of identity as... Yeah as mythical things. W.Y. Evans Wentz, in The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, published in 1911, explains that in modern Irish tradition, the people of the Shi, or simply the Shi, refer to the beings themselves rather than to their places of habitation, as we discussed. Partly due to the belief that the Shi are a subterranean race, they are sometimes described as gods of the earth. And since it was believed that they, like the modern fairies, control the ripening of crops and the milk giving of cows, the ancient Irish rendered to them regular worship and sacrifice, just as the Irish of today, in 1911, do so by setting out food at night for the fairy folk to eat. You, you preempted me there by mentioning that it was in 1911. Yes. Just wanted to make it very clear that we do not believe that's what the Irish folk today do. Although we did have a very interesting comment from someone on our Instagram, at Gobs and Boblins. <laughs> At Gods and Goblins, that's the name of the podcast. Gobs and Boblins is going to be our, <laughs> is our spin-off show. That's just, I think Gobs and Boblins is the name of our um, blooper reel at the end. <laughs> that it seems that there is, even to this day, somewhat of the fairy faith still alive. Like, there was a recent um, road that had to be diverted because it was going to go through a fairy hill. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that was in Ireland? Yeah, like... Oh. In the last few years. I, I know there's still a big thing about the Hilde folk in, like, um, Iceland. Yeah, apparently so. Pretty cool, huh? And so in the Irish fairy mythology, we've got the Tuatha de Danann, the immortals from Irish legend. We've got these versions of them that are more, like, pagan nature gods or spirits. And then we have the she themselves, the smaller, more diminutive fairies that we are familiar with. But they've all tended to be described as coming from these fairy hills and forts. 
Evans Wentz goes on to describe that their marvellous palaces were hidden in the depths of the earth, in hills or under ridges more or less elevated. Also in mountain caverns, like those of Ben Bulbin or Knock Mar. Are you laughing at the name Ben Bulbin? Yeah. I mean, that is quite funny. Or in fairy hills or knolls, like the fairy hill at Aberfoyle, or beneath lakes. We'll discuss that later. And in these tales, the land where the fairies have their palaces is a place without illness, decay, or ageing, as well as time existing differently in fairyland. For example, a single day there can last many human years. Isn't that a good thing? Imagine how much work you can get done. Yeah, but I don't think you're allowed to bring your laptop. No PowerPoints, I guess. One tale of a fairy hill is known as the Calf of Noxagauna. Recorded in Fairy Legends and Traditions of the South of Ireland by Thomas Crofton Croker and Tipperary Folk Tales by Aideen McBride. Noxagauna is a townland in County Tipperary, translated from the original Gaelic, means the hill of the fairy calf. The story behind that is the very story that we are telling today. The fairies that dwelt upon the hill of Noxagauna had become frustrated that the cows and sheep the farmer had put up there were constantly trampling around and disrupting their dancing and revelries. So, one night, once the herdsmen had settled down into their watch, the fairy queen appeared in front of them and began to dance, now in one shape, now in another, but all ugly and frightful to behold. One time, she would be a great horse, with the wings of an eagle and the tail like a dragon, hissing loud and spitting fire. Then, in a moment, she would change into a little man lame of leg with a bull's head and a lambent flame playing around it. Then into a great ape with duck's feet and a turkey's tail. Then she would roar or neigh or hiss or bellow or howl or hoot. As never yet was roaring, neighing, hissing, bellowing, howling or hooting heard in this world before or since. And all the while the rest of the fairy court held open the herder's eyes and chased around the cows biting as if they were gadflies. In the nights that followed, the herd could go barely an hour without some sort of accident befalling them. They could fall into pits or down in the river and either be maimed or killed outright. As for the herdsmen, their bodies were spared, but one visit from the fairies was enough to send even the stoutest man quite mad. The farmer offered double, triple, quadruple the wages, but not a man could be found willing to go for a night with the fairies. With the herd thinning and no man willing to step foot atop the hill of Noxagauna, the fairies resumed their feasting, and they gambled as merrily as before, quaffing dewdrops from acorns and spreading their feast on the heads of capacious mushrooms. The farmer sat on the side of the road, glaring up at the hilltop, and wondering what on earth he could possibly do. That hilltop was the best grazing patch in the whole of Tipperary, and he'd be starving himself if he could not find a way to use it. When all of a sudden he spied, walking down the road, Larry O'Toole, the finest piper in fifteen parishes. The only thing he was more known for than his pipes was his fondness for drinking. For people would say that once he had a few drinks in him, he'd cheerfully tell the devil himself to go back to hell and play him a marching tune for the journey. Seeing the farmer in distress, Larry asked what the matter was, and the farmer laid out his fairy-related misfortunes. If that's all that ails you, said Larry, make your mind easy. Were there as many fairies in Notchigauna as there are potato blossoms in Elagerty, I would face them. It would be a queer thing indeed if I, who was never afraid of a proper man, should turn my back on a brat of a fairy not the bigness of one's thumb. The farmer, smiling for the... <laughs> God, he had to put a tongue twister in there, didn't he? The farmer, smiling for the first time in weeks at his self-possessed Piper's proclamations, promised that should Larry watch his herd for one week, then the farmer should look after him until the day he died. So, that night, drunk on barley wine, Larry strode to the top of a hill and sat upon a stone beneath the hollow of a tree. He began piping a lively tune, so jolly that it could make the trees dance. Soon enough, the fairies caught wind of his tunes, and he heard them laughing at the idea of another man being fool enough to come up to their hill. Looking up hastily, he saw between the moon and him a great black cat standing on the very tips of its claws, with its back up and mewing the voice of a water mill. Presently, it swelled up towards the sky, and turning round on its left hind leg, whirled till it fell to the ground, from which it started up in the shape of a salmon, with a cravat around its neck and a pair of new top boots. Larry watched on, and with a wink, said to the fairy queen, Go on, Jewel. If you dance, I'll play. So she turned into this and that and the other, but Larry still played on, as well as he knew how. At last, she lost patience, as ladies will do when you do not mind their scolding. Do you want to say anything there, Helen? The lady in the room? I have only one question. Hmm. Is the salmon wearing boots on little legs? <laughs> 
Or are they on its fins? I can't imagine. Or is it just one boot that the entire tail goes into? I see. I, I was imagining him kind of carrying them in his little mouth. That was not what I was anticipating. Sensing that he was not going to be scared off, the fairy queen hatched a plan. She transformed herself into a milk white calf with large brown eyes, in the hopes of catching him off guard. Larry, though, was smarter than perhaps the fairy queen had given him credit for. And no sooner had the calf approached him than Larry laid down his pipes and leapt upon its back. But the queen had one last trick up her sleeve and leapt in a second a full ten miles up into the air before swooping across and over the Shannon River. They landed with enough force to throw Larry clean off the calf and to the ground. But he didn't waste a second and bounced straight back to his feet. He looked the calf dead in the eyes and said, By my word, well done. That was not a bad leap for a calf. Oh, shots fired. <laughs> the fairy took a second to process this and knew once and for all that she had been bested by this gin-soaked piper. She resumed her own shape and promised from that day forth, so long as Larry was looking after the herd, that she nor her fairy retinue would ever bother them again. And with that, the farmer kept to his word and Larry built her house and was able to pipe and drink of the farmer's expense for the rest of his days. The hill of Noxigauna was peaceful until the day that Larry died, pickled but happy. As for whether the fairies took back their residence at the hill after his passing, I simply cannot say they did. They absolutely did. Yeah, they're back. They're back, bitches! Until it got in like a, a byway. So we've discussed the fairy hills and mounds of Ireland. Let's move on to Scotland. Robert Kirk collected tales from the Scottish Highlands of fairies being seen at certain phases of the moon within their hills that are raised on high pillars for the time that they are visible. How does a hill be on a pillar? I, I thought what you meant was the fairies are on pillars on the hills. No! Wait, maybe. No, I think the hills are on pillars. Oh. So like you've got pillars going up and then the hills on top. Oh, like, um, like Daddy Long Legs. I was thinking more like a viaduct. What are you talking about? Uh, those weird, like, kind of automated things that used to go into the sea in Brighton. Yeah, I know the ones. Like, um, before the piers in the Victorian times, they had these weird, like, mechanical walking platforms that would go into the sea that looked like AT-ATs from Star Wars. Yeah, they were called Daddy Long Legs. They look mental. Yeah. Regardless, this seems to have been a belief inherited from Scandinavia, where fairy mounds are brought up on red pillars so that they can feast with their neighbours. Where do you think that idea came from? Particularly with red pillars, like, surely there's got to be something there that would make somebody, like, stop and take notice and go, oh, maybe that's for fairies. Maybe they have, like, some really red trees or something, or, like, something mountainous or glacial, maybe looks like pillars in the night, I don't know. In the accounts recorded by Robert Kirk, every quarter year, as the season changes, the fairy inhabitants of these hills will move from one place to the next, swapping houses a bit like hermit crabs swap their shells, I thought. And during this time, it is dangerous to walk on the fairy paths, the well-trodden lines between fairy mounds, as the entrances into fairyland are open at this time, and fairies are abroad. In his fairy faith in Celtic countries, Evans Wentz, again, ventured out into the Highlands and was able to speak to a man named John Dunbar, who had this to say of the Highland fairies. My grandmother believed firmly in fairies, and I have heard her tell a good many stories about them. They were a small people dressed in green and had dwellings underground in dry spots. Fairies were often heard in the hills over there, he points, and I believe something was there. They were awful for music and used to be heard very often playing the bagpipes. When he says awful, does he mean, is, is that like an archaic use of the term awful or is it just saying they were terrible? They were shit bagpipes? at music. God, those bagpipes sound like garbage. They're too small. That's the problem with bagpipes, not large and cacophonous enough. I think a miniature bagpipe would be mm, no worse. I think that'd be worse. <laughs> Rather than... <laughs> you know? <laughs> there's, a there's a comparison for you a woman wouldn't go out in the dark after giving birth to a child before the child was christened so as not to give the fairies power over her or the child and I have heard people say that if fairies were refused milk and meat they would take a horse or cow and that if well treated they would repay all gifts very much the inspiration from Mac MacFiegel from Discord in that regard yeah just taking them sheep running away so yes living in mounds in dry spots, playing bagpipes. Great guys. But some fairies in this region seem rather more rough and ready than the stately she. 
with reports of fairy packs hunting down sheep and cows, and even of fairies going toe-to-toe and fighting with rams. That sounds fantastic. Hello. Hog boy. Ha! <laughs> Me? <laughs> it's the next thing we're talking about. Hog boons or hog boys, meaning mound dwellers, live inside fairy mounds in the Orkneys, and they will guard these burial chambers from intruders. Hogboons became intermingled with stories of hobgoblins, probably due to the similarity in their name, and became guardians of farms too. And they will happily mend equipment laid out for them and protect farm animals from malevolent spirits. But a hogboon does expect to be rewarded for his work, so milk and ale should be poured on his mound. Pouring them out. Pouring one out for the, the hog boy minis. <laughs> Hog boonies? I, mean, I will happily take the, the nickname Hogboy, by the way. Hogboy Kieran Hill. Maybe that can be, we need like uh, monikers for this. <laughs> you can be Hogboy Kieran Hill. What can I be? Heather something Morehouse. We'll know when it comes. Yeah. We'll know when the right name reveals itself to us. And should anyone try to dig up his mound, the Hogboy will appear as a little grey man and ferociously attack the person. More rustic still are the Cobbler now and Cornish mining fairies. The cobbler now do not necessarily live in an alternate land of their own underground, like the she, but they live and work alongside their human mining colleagues. In fact, we talked about them last episode. So if you'd like more information on the cobbler now and the knockers, I would recommend listening to episode 2B. But to summarise, they are helpful spirits and will lead miners to rich veins of ore. And might be the spirits of those involved in crucifixion, Mm -hmm. despite living in caves in Cornwall. They would lead miners to rich veins of ore, and the appreciative humans will give them small treats in return. In Cornwall, these would generally be the leftovers of the iconic Cornish pasty. There are several theories surrounding the pasty's crimped crust. Some say it was not meant to be eaten, since the miners' hands may have been contaminated with arsenic, which is a byproduct of processing tin. But others argue that the miners likely just ate their pies in some sort of wrapping to avoid ingesting the toxins. Another reason for the thick crust, you ask? Heather, are there any other reasons why a Cornish pasty might have a thick crust? Thank you for that extremely unscripted question. Well, it's a built-in offering to the knockers. You can just pop that crust straight off and give it to the knockers as these mischievous spirits were believed to cause trouble if they weren't appeased with little treats. Apparently old-timey Cornish pasties (laughs) used to have, like, all of the courses in them. So you'd have the meat and potatoes... And then, like, some pudding. Yes, yeah, like, like, just jam at the end. Yeah, it sounds absolutely disgusting. Did you know there are some accounts of underground fairies in mainland England as well? I did not. Please continue. Well, you should, because one of them is based in Oxfordshire. And it's based around the Rollwright Stones. I used to get drunk near there. Yay! Weren't you the one that defaced them? No. Mm. No. So, the Rollwright Stones is a stone circle near the village of Great Rollwright. And at one point in time, around the time that Kieran was a teenager getting drunk at the Stones every weekend, they were defaced. And a CCTV image went around that looked suspiciously like young teenage Kieran Hill. Hog boy himself. A hog lad at the time. This is slander. You know me. Would I deface, like, an artefact? Yeah. I'm so lazy. This is when you were a hog baby. You weren't fully <laughs> matured at the time. It looks kind of like me. It looks a lot like you. It looks a lot like me. Well, it's clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a defacer of artefacts. Did you not even realise the importance of these stones? They are thought to be raised by druids. Druids! And it's said that this was where the fairies were last seen in Oxfordshire disappearing down a hole next to the kingstone of the circle after coming up to the surface for a night of fairy revelry. You know, now they're never coming back. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, you should I, 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 I can do it. You <laughs> confessed! <laughs> Why would you apologise if you didn't do it? Because I've been accused of stuff and I'm very weak. There's many more fairy hills and barrows in England as well, one of which is known as Pudding Pie Hill. Oh, where's that? It is near Sowerby in Yorkshire. And it's called Pudding Pie Hill due to its resemblance to a pie or pudding. It's a burial site of a type called a long barrow, which means it's long rather than circular, which dates from the late Neolithic period to the Bronze Age, around 2400 to 1500 BC. 
And I assumed you probably pissed on that as well. <laughs> that, I, you know I've never been north of Birmingham. That's true. According to local legend, to listen to the fairies that reside in the mound, one has to run around the barrow nine times and then plunge a blade of a knife into its turf and put one's ear to the ground. You probably have to run around it with shins. You really want to say the word with the shins there, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> it means anti-clockwise. There's a story like that of the, uh, of the church in Tiffin Northam as well, apparently. If you run around it like eight times at midnight, you'll see a ghost. Oh, what's the ghost called? I don't know. I guess it's just uh, you're quite woozy by then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in a tale recorded by both the Essex Chronicler, Ralph of Coggers Hall, and Yorkshire's William of Newborough, two green children were found near Woolpit in Suffolk at the mouth of a cave that may have been an entrance into an underground fairyland. The children, a girl and a boy, looked like normal humans, but their skin and hair was all tinged with green. They were taken into the home of a local knight, Sir Richard de Calne, but despite being given gentle care, they wept bitterly and spoke in an unrecognisable language. The green children were offered bread, honey and milk, but did not eat anything despite clearly being very hungry. That is, however, until they were given green beans, which they tried to eat all in one, until they were shown how to open up the pods and eat the fresh beans inside. This is actually all they would consume for quite some time. Eventually, the children would learn to explain that everyone and everything in the country they came from was green, and that the sun wasn't bright there as it is overground, but the light was soft as a sunset. The children had been following their green flocks until they came to a cavern in which they heard the tantalising sound of bells. <coughs> following the tunnel for a long way, the green children found themselves at the mouth of the cave. Emerging and becoming dazzled by the bright sunlight and the heat of this land, they fell to the ground and lay there for a long while. When they were awoken by the people that found them, the children tried to fly but could not, and they were not able to find their way back home. The version of this story recorded by Ernest Rees in Fairy Gold, a book of old English fairy tales, suggested that the children may have returned to their home. But another chronicle tells us that Sir Richard de Calm got the children baptised and gradually they learned to communicate and to eat a more varied diet than green beans. After some time, their green hue even faded from their complexion. Sadly, the boy, though, didn't last long in the human realm and died not long after. But the girl acclimatised better and grew up into adulthood. She even married and had a family and settled in Kings Lynn in Norfolk. There are quite a few explanations for these green children. All these stories that we share... Are shared in the form of first-hand accounts pretty much yeah but weirdly this one is treated way more as like an urban legend like yeah. a real story than most of them yeah this is something i i had heard of before we started doing this yeah and it's kind of treated as like a sort of supernatural yeah. real life story i don't know why this one gets chosen over the others but there you go there have been many explanations and ruminations upon this story since it was first shared in the 12th century one of course, is that they're fairies. Ah! Hence the reason they're in this episode. And the place that they were said to have originated from is sometimes referred to as St. Martin's Land, a synonym for fairyland, which is a subterranean land without extreme heat or cold and in permanent twilight. Hence why they were so dazzled by the bright light when they came up to the ground where the humans live. And less gravity? But we were trying to fly. Like fairies. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's just saying fairies can do sometimes. Yeah. They very often can't fly, though, can they? Well, they don't have wings, but they can yeah. fly. Or they use, like, ragwort or something. Yeah. Also, of course, fairies often being described as in green, so there's mm. the green skin going on. It all kind of links in. In A Companion to the Gawain Poet by D.S. Brewer, which is a book all about Gawain, the knight from Arthurian legend, who is green. He talks about just the theme of green things in folklore for a while. And he gives us the explanation that these young children were following flocks from their village and strayed away by accident. And once they were found, they didn't speak very much or perhaps just spoke in a slightly different dialect or a heavy accent from the people who found them. And because they were small children, they couldn't describe exactly where they had come from or what the address was. So they were like, oh, these children must be fairies or some kind of weirdos. <laughs> And he also suggests that they were suffering from chlorosis, which is a version of anemia, which is iron deficiency, that causes a pale green tinted skin tone oh. and was referred to as green sickness, thus explaining why the green tint disappears when they are given a better diet. Or maybe. Or maybe. Just maybe. 
according to articles from such valued and high quality sources as the sun in an article in 2017 they were britain's first aliens yeah i buy it yeah yeah actually which 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 theory do you subscribe to aliens yeah good good do you think that they were just some stray kids who are a bit sick i mean it's possible right like obviously there's gonna be a bit of embellishment you know everything that we lived in was green we tried to fly they didn't know what a green bean was somebody from that village tells somebody else from that village who adds a few embellishments and blah 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 until you've got this entire story about these children who've come from a fairy kingdom rather from you know down way potentially there is a grain of truth in there but i imagine yeah. there's a lot of just story wrapped around right. it it's folklore that's what it all is so, so yeah if there's one thing i've learned from doing this so far is that almost all of this seems to start with something real yeah some fairies live above ground in the more remote areas of the landscape away from humans and other fairies too. The fairies that live in these mountain and woodlandy areas are often wilder, more primal fairies that seem a little more like nature spirits than the developed idea of a fairy in British folklore that we've discussed mostly. Some of these woodland spirits are known as oakmen. Tales of oakmen range from the north down to Somerset. In some stories, the oakmen are kindly forest dwarves who look after the animals much in the same way that a brownie looks after humans although their kindness is extended solely towards their furry and feathered friends. In the case of The Brown Man of the Moors, which is said to be a story about oakmen, Sir Walter Scott ooh, relates a tale of what happens should a human disrespect an oakman's ward. Two men from Newcastle had been hunting on the high moors above Elsdon, when after much time they sat down by a brook to take a look at the day's bounty and have a drink. They hadn't been there long when the younger man looked up and saw across the brook, standing under an ash tree, was the brown man of the moors. A dwarf, very strong and stoutly built, his dress brown like withered bracken, his head covered with frizzled red hair, his countenance ferocious, and his eyes glowing like those of a bull. The younger man stood up and greeted the dwarf from across the brook. The dwarf, remaining in the shade of the ash tree, spoke in a guttural tone to admonish the boy for trespassing on his home and thoughtlessly slaughtering the animals who were under his guardianship. The boy interjected that surely if the dwarf was allowed to eat the animals that he lived with, then he could hardly be surprised when others did the same. Besides, there were plenty of animals in this forest for everyone to share. The dwarf, looking madder by the moment, explained that he did not eat the animals in his forest. He was a vegetarian. He considered them equals. Have I written a bad bit? It's, it's like a six line sentence. Okay, do you want to break it up a bit then? No, I, just, I have to just convert some commas into full stops. Yes. In my mind. I'm sorry, Heather. It's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be more like wary of this just, in the future. Just, yeah, imagine yourself reading it out loud. What I should do, actually, is once I've done a story, just read it out loud. Mm. Actually, that's absolutely what I should be doing. Yeah. The dwarf... Oh, you. The dwarf, much like the deer and the rabbits that he shared his home with, lived off whortleberries, nuts and apples. What's a whortleberry? Apparently, it's a little like a bilberry or a blueberry. Bilberry? Or a loganberry. What's a bilberry? It's a bit like a whortleberry. Ask a stupid question. Get a very reasonable answer. Get a very reasonable They're all from the same family, vaccinium. Huh. That's the Latin name for berries in this family, Vax- huh. vaccinium. Do you just, like, know about stuff? That's really impressive. It's only because I found out what that mystery plant in the garden was a while ago and found oh, out yeah. that it was a vaccinium, and I thought it was quite interesting because it sounds like vaccine. Maybe people thought they caused vaccines. I don't know. I don't know, Kieran. I don't know. In fact, said the dwarf, his voice cooling to something resembling amiable. Will you step on over and visit me home? I'll show you just how many things you can do with a whortleberry. That sounds very threatening. <laughs> Please don't stick a whortleberry up my bum. <laughs> it wasn't up your bum. The lad was just about to leap to the chase when his companion, who had previously been watching from just behind a large rock, spoke up all of a sudden. Come on, lad, it's time we was off. The boy looked to the man and then back to the dwarf, who in an instant had vanished completely out of sight. Brian! whined the boy. You scared him off. He was just about to give me some whortleberry recipes. No, lad, had you crossed the brook, that fiend would have torn you to ribbons. Now come, it's nearly dark, and I want to bag a deer before the day's done. 
And so off they went, killing themselves a further two pheasants and a rabbit before the night drew in. It's indubitable that the old man saved the younger one that afternoon, but it's just as certain that by not heeding the dwarf's words and killing more animals that day, they had doomed themselves both. For within the year, they were both to be buried, and those at the funerals felt for sure that had they just stopped their hunting in the brown man's domain, they'd have survived to an old, old age. I like that brown man. The little wood man. I like him. He's, a, he's just an aggressive vegan. Not all stories of oak men are about little brown dwarves, though. Sometimes they are the trees themselves. Not dissimilar to the Ents in Lord of the Rings. Oh, I love the Ents. They're the best, man. They are really the best ones. One story, originating from Somerset, tells that angry oak men are said to haunt any coppice growing from felled oak trees, and it's considered wise by locals to give any coppice a wide berth following sunset. The Gwichlian are frightening female fairies who haunt lonely roads in the Welsh mountains and lead travellers astray in the night. They are depicted like hags. Hags? Hags, which I think will be the subject that we cover after. We're done with fairies. I think you might be right. Love a good hag. So the Gwicklian have the semblance of a poor old woman with an oblong four-cornered hat, ash-coloured clothes, and with her apron thrown across her shoulder. Comparisons can be drawn to Hecate of Greek mythology, the, you know, apex witch of mythology, pretty much, who was a grim hag herself who rode the storm. And in fact, Gwicklian was said to enter people's homes during storms if fresh water wasn't left out for them. The name Gwicklian is taken from the Welsh word Gwil. 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 I don't know if you do the ch if it's at the end of a word. This word signifies gloom, shade, duskiness, a hag, a witch, a fairy, or a goblin. All these meanings come together in the description of these gloomy mountain spirits, which are quite opposite to the elf-like Echlichlon of the forest glades and dingles, which are much more beneficent. Just any excuse to say the word dingle, really. Right. It's just really good. Such a fun word. Let's move on to fairies that inhabit bodies of water. Being, of course, a couple of islands with quite a lot of little tiny islands around it, there's quite a lot of water around Britain. So water takes quite a key part in a lot of these myths and legends. I think that was a very good segue. How dare you? Hey, no, I, I, I liked it. We're keeping things a little bit dark and edgy, actually, moving on from the Gwichlian in this bit, because lakes and rivers are often linked to the underworld in mythology, with, of course, the river Styx in Greek myth being the prime example. Davies in Mythology and Rites of the British Druids, oh. which sounds like a very good book, I must read the rest of it at some stage, describes a tale of a small lake in the mountains near Brecknock in Wales, which is said to be an entrance into the underworld. Although in the context of British folklore, I think quite interestingly, underworld seems to have come to mean the fairy realm, kind of mixing those mythologies together. Thomas Cately, in the fairy mythology, shares a story of what may be that very same lake in Brecknock and what lies within it. Every year on May Day, a door in a rock by the lake was found open. And anyone curious enough to enter through the door would find themselves following a narrow passage that ran underneath the lake and opened out onto a small island in the centre of it. On this little island was a beautiful garden, overflowing with ripe fruit and flowers blooming in every colour. The garden was tended by the Tilworth Teg, or the Fair Family, a kind of fairy whose beauty could be equalled only by the courtesy and affability which they exhibited to those who pleased them. The fair folk would gather fruit and flowers for their guests and entertain them with enchanting music and whisper the secrets of the future into their ears and invite their guests to stay with them for as long as they pleased. Their only caveat was that the island must remain secret and that nothing could be taken from it into the human world. If on one of these days a passerby was to look at the lake from its edge, this scene would be entirely invisible. Only a keen observer might notice that no birds flew over the water and that on some sweet mornings a few strains of music would float over the breeze. On one particular May Day, some sacrilegious wretch left the company of the Tilworth Teg with one of their flowers in his pocket. The fair family waved him goodbye at the threshold to the passage and wished him well. But as soon as the man's foot touched the ground outside their land, he grew dizzy and the flower vanished from its hiding place. 
At that, the fairies shut the door, and while the occasional bar of fairy song is heard at the lake, they have never reopened the door to invite lucky mortals to join them. Sometime after this, an even more foolhardy person attempted to drain the lake to gain access to the garden, when a terrific form arose from the midst of the lake, commanding him to desist, or otherwise he would drown the entire country. Steal a flower? You're not allowed to our parties anymore. Steal all our flowers, we'll murder you all horribly. I mean, you know what, natural escalation. Regarding fairies that actually live in the water, we have the Welsh Gragef Anon, literally meaning wives of the lower world, or hell. And they live in lakes and rivers, particularly those far away from human society, hidden away in the lonely mountains. These bodies of water serve as avenues of communication between this world and the lower one, known as Anon, or the underworld which is a shadowy fairy realm ruled over by Gwyn Ap Nud, the king of the fairies, according to the Welsh mythology superstar. <laughs> That's what I wrote. Let me guess. Is it Wirt Sykes? It's Wirt Sykes! The Gragath Anon are emphatically not mermaids. They are your typical elfin fairy ladies and not fishy at all. Crumlin Lake, near the village of Britain Ferry, is one home of these water fairies. It is also believed that a large town lies submerged beneath the water there, and that the Gragith Anon have turned the walls of that city into a magnificent fairy palace. One story of the Gragith Anon involves some pretty big names. I'm very proud of this one. I really like this story. <laughs> I just think it's really funny. One day in the misty past, St. Patrick came over from Ireland to visit his buddy St. David of Wales, just to say, how do you do? They were taking a stroll along the banks of a river, chatting about some religious stuff. God. Snakes. Books. Matthew. When some people spotted them, recognising the saints and starting a great hubbub with lots of raised voices and pointing. St. Patrick was... he knew how to handle this. Hello, country folk, he said. Sure, you can have an autograph. Come on over, he began, but stopped short when he realised that these Welsh villagers were hurling abuse at him for leaving Wales to go over to Ireland. Welsh being his native language, though, he understood what they were saying, and he was fuming. To punish them for their rudeness, and for injuring his pride a little, he had a quick word with God, and caused the villagers to flop over into the river and be transformed into fishes. The women, however, did not turn into fishes. They're not like mermaids. Instead, they were turned into fairies. Huh. The Gragath Anon. Also, dear listener, you should have heard Verontri we did the other day when Heather tried her Irish accent for St. Patrick. It was something. It was inappropriate. <laughs> it certainly was. It was highly inappropriate. Sea fairies, you ask? Heather, what about sea fairies? What are sea fairies? Heather, can you tell me something about sea fairies? Heather. <laughs> That's enough questions. Sea fairies? Enough questions. Hush, hush, hush. Britain certainly has its fair share of mermaid mythology. And one could argue that they are a form of fairy or sea nymph. But I reckon they are different enough to the rest of the fairies that we're discussing to cover in a separate episode in a later time, okay? So right now you get no information, nothing. Heather, does Britain have a lot of mythology about sea fairies? And are they in any way distinct from mermaids? And would you say, if they were, that they should be covered in a separate episode? My answer to that is yes. So while we're gonna park sea fairies for now, there are other water-dwelling fairy types who live around Wells and springs, water sources. Here's a little quote by Walter Gregor in The Folklore of the Northeast of Scotland. Fairies were believed to dwell inside green sunny hillocks and knolls, as we have discussed, beside a river or a stream or a lake, or by the sea braes, in gorgeous palaces furnished with everything that was bright and beautiful. They had wells too, called, can you guess it, fairy wells. All that paid a visit to such wells left something in them, a pin or a button. Such wells seem to have been different from those having a curative power. In certain stories, fairies have a certain aversion to running water, but are, conversely, known to live around lakes and wells. Just thought, um, the brown man from our story earlier, mm. is that why he wanted the boy to cross the brook rather than going over the other way? He couldn't cross it. Maybe. Like a vampire. You, you were saying the other day that you were wondering if it might be because it's like clean. Yeah, I was theorising upon it that fresh water that's running is really considered like cleaner than still water because mm. it has like less algae and germs and that in it. So maybe it's seen as pure 
and uh, goodly. Wells inhabited by fairies are noted for bringing both good and bad luck, depending on how people act around them. A poem written by Samuel Ferguson details how one can use a fairy well to obtain good luck. The fairy well of Langanay, lie nearer me, I tremble so. Una, I have heard wise women say, hearken to my tale of woe, that if before the dews arise, true maiden in its icy flow, with pure hand bathe her bosom thrice, three lady brackens pluck likewise, and three times around the fountain go, she straight forgets her tears and sighs. The moon year will do that to you. You sit in the well. Yeah. Uh-huh. You splash the water on your tits. Yep. You get some lady brackens. Don't know what those are. It's pubic hair, isn't it? Mm, maybe, maybe. And then run around the fountain three times, and then either you lose your memory entirely, or your tears and sighs depart you. Hurrah. As well as being the home to fairies, wells can be used to trap fairies that have done ill. As is the case at Robin Roundcap's well at Spaldington Hall in Yorkshire. The story goes that a hobgoblin by the name of Robin Roundcap had made his home at the since demolished hall. He would help the staff with their threshing duties, as per usual, but was also a mischievous sort and liked to put out fires in the hearth and kick over milk pails. Deciding that the bad he was doing outweighed the good, the parish priest was called and used his powers of prayer to banish the hobgoblin into the well. But his memory lives on because they named the well after the little hobgoblin. Because I guess at least a couple of people who probably had mostly the threshing duties were like, oh, bugger, I missed that guy. (laughs) The fire stokers and milk gatherers were pretty chuffed. Fairy butter is a good omen that is often found at wells. Water sources near Baysdale in Yorkshire and Egton Grange in Whitby both recorded tales of fairy butter appearing. Fairy butter is a golden, fast-growing fungus that looks like globs of butter that have been thrown around by a mischievous fairy in the night. Oh! (laughs) When found in a home, it is a great sign of good luck, suggesting that fairies are on your side and have blessed your house. Or that your walls are damp. But it does look cool. It does look really cool. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of fungus. You, 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 you are a fungus fanatic. Not, well, there you go. That, that suggests that I am at least in some way some sort of amateur mycologist and go mushroom hunting, which I don't do because I'm absolutely cripplingly scared of getting poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> Joan Van Dock, you made three watching on BBC4 about mushrooms. We talked about that twice now. Maybe. <laughs> thought we talked about the wrong Save BBC4! <laughs> in my looking up of information about fairy butter, I found a recipe in The Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold, which was published in 1769, for an edible version of fairy butter for those who couldn't quite get that tasty-looking tremella mesenterica out of their minds. Take the yolks of four eggs boiled hard, a quarter of a pound of butter, beat two ounces of sugar into a large spoonful of orange flower water, and then beat them all together into a fine paste. Let it stand for two or three hours, then rub it through a colander upon a plate. It looks very pretty. And they say the English can't cook. (laughs) I don't know, I'd eat it, it sounds pretty good. You would eat anything with eggs in it though. I am, I'm a big egg fan. Speaking of real folkloric treats, but this time for the eyes, there is the custom known as well dressing that's particularly associated with the Peak District counties, Derbyshire and Staffordshire. And it's an English folk art practice of building large monuments of wood. And then after drawing a certain image on it in clay, flowers and plants are placed in so as to create a piece of living art. They're really, really beautiful. And it's thought that the practice was originally developed as a way of appeasing water nymphs. However, once Christianity came into Britain, the practice was condemned as idolatry. (sighs) The first recorded occurrence of the practice after its condemnation is in the village of Tissington in Derbyshire. And this was in 1349, and in celebration of the fact that the district was the only one in its area to escape the Black Death, thanks to the cleanliness of its water supply. In fact, Tissington continues the tradition to this day, over the week of the Feast of the Ascension. I visited the website, visitpeakdistrict.com, to try and get some information upon these well dressings, and uh, they're all cancelled. That being said, I cannot recommend highly enough that people go and just Google image well dressings they're genuinely beautiful yeah they're really detailed they make these structures around the tops of the wells and the pictures that they make are really gorgeous yeah really really impressive i'd love to see them in person one day yes 
maybe put it on my YouTube. Yeah, no. I'm, I'm just getting carried away. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Through reading all this stuff and, and writing about it, we've got like such a long list of places we want to visit on significant days of the folkloric year. Oh, I'm so excited. I see so much more is dancing. Oh, oh my God, right? So we've talked about lots of fairy places that are very linked to the landscape itself and elements of it. But there are also tales of fairy palaces that are visible to humans only when the fairies invite them. Only to vanish at any moment when the fairies grow tired of these people's company. And it's almost as if these castles exist in a slightly different version of the world. Like in a parallel dimension! The Celtic Saint Colin once visited a fairy palace on the top of Glastonbury Tor. Colin made himself a hermitage at the foot of the Tor, which means hill, and one day heard two men talking about the King of the Fairies, at which point Colin poked his head out of his hermit hole and told the men to shut up as they were talking of devils. Colin was 100% sure that fairies were demons. The men became worried as the King of the Fairies would not forgive such an insult and would surely send for Colin. And they were right. As a few days later, a stranger came to Colin's door and asked him to come and meet the king. Colin thrice refused until he finally agreed to come with the stranger, but not before hiding a sprinkler of holy water underneath his hermit cloak. As they arrived at the top of Glastonbury Tor, the fairy palace was visible to him, full of bright lights and bewitching fairy music. Handsome youths rode mighty steeds around the courtyard, and beautiful light-footed maidens danced between them. Inside, the king was sat on a golden throne at the head of a banquet, with pages waiting on him, dressed in dazzling shades of scarlet and blue. The king greeted Colin warmly, and invited the hermit to partake in the feast, promising the rarest of foods, wine, and courtly services. No smut. Don't want smut on this podcast. Okay, I'll stop waggling my eyebrows then. Thank you. I do not eat the leaves of a tree, rebuked Colin, flouting all common beliefs that demand humans are polite to the fair folk, and sending a shudder around the banqueting hall. And your pages! Blue is the colour of the eternal cold, and red for the burning flames of hell from whence you came! This guy sounds like no fun. At which point, Colin grabbed his holy water and threw it over the fairies, causing the king, the castle, and the court to disappear in an instant. Ah, uh, mating, mating, like that. You've ruined a good time for everyone. Well done, Colin. St. Colin was pretty big on taking down anything pagan, actually. One time, a Greek leader named Brass challenged the Pope to single combat. He did what? You can't just challenge the Pope to a fight. Well, he bloody did. And the agreement was that the winner would take on the loser's followers. Pope clearly isn't going to be good at fighting. No. So, don't you worry. Actually, that's a fair point. Maybe that's why you do challenge the Pope to a fight. Well, yeah, exactly. This is like a big burly Greek yeah. called Brass. But don't you worry. Colin stepped into the fight because he was not only Saki, he was buff. He fought in the Pope's place and defeated Brass. After moving away from Glastonbury later in his life, Colin went to Wales and settled on a new hermitage until he discovered a giantess living in a nearby mountain pass who was eating the villagers. Not nice. So he fought her too, cutting off one of her arms. She then picked up her arm and started beating him with it until he sliced the other one off too. And then he killed her. I don't like this guy. We also have another story, which will be our final tale for today of another fairy castle that appeared and disappeared in the twinkling of an eye. It's called The Legend of Innis Sark. And this version is collected by Lady Francesca Speranza Wilde, who we've heard from before, in her book Ancient Legends, Mystic Charms and Superstitions of Ireland. Oh, quick fact for you. She is Oscar Wilde's mum. Uh, really? Yeah. Right, according to Wikipedia. Huh, that's kind of cool. The girls of the island of Innisboffin knew better than to go out when the moon was full. For if the fairies didn't carry them off to the fairy country, then even hearing a single note of fairy music or taking a single sup of fairy wine could change their lives forever, and within a year they'd have either disappeared or died. The boys, on the other hand, were slightly braver, or perhaps just foolhardy, as the fairies were just as keen to grab boys to fight in their wars. For you see, the fairies of Innisboffin were split into two parties, 
one a gentle race that loved music and dancing, and the other who had attained their powers from the devil himself, and were always trying to work evil. One particular young man had fallen asleep beneath a haystack one summer evening, and the fairies must have carried him off, as when he awoke he found himself in a grand hall, where a great number of small men dressed in finery were going about their work. Some spinning, some making shoes, some making spears and arrowheads out of fish bones and elf stones, but all busy laughing and singing with much glee and merriment, while the little pipers played the merriest tunes. In the corner there sat an old man, who presently got up and approached the boy with a very stern look upon his face. What are you doing standing there all gormless like the man said. We've got friends coming to dinner. Now down to the kitchen with you. And brandishing his stick, he walloped the boy until he'd driven the boy down to the kitchen. The kitchen, in stark contrast to the hall, was dingy. So dingy, in fact, the boy had to feel his way along a dank, mildew-ridden wall until he came to a fire, with a large pot hanging above it. The old man, having followed him down, began barking at him. Now, begin to prepare the food. This old hag shall provide our meat this evening. And to his horror, the boy spun around to see a naked, trembling old woman, sagging to her knees, but suspended up by her arms. The old man strode up to her, took a knife and sliced into the old woman's skin, and began stripping flesh from her back. Did you not hear me? demanded the old man. Get that pot boiling. Company will be here very soon, and she'll take forever to cook. So cut her into pieces and throw her in the pot. The boy, however, was so overcome by fright and fear that he fell to the floor, completely speechless. Get up, you fool! said the old man, giving the boy another thwack with his cane for good measure. Do your work and never mind. This does not hurt her a bit. When she was there above in the world, she was a wicked miser. Hard to the world and cruel and bitter in her words and work. So now we have her here. Her soul will never rest in peace, because we shall cut her body up into little bits, and the soul will not be able to find it, but wander about in the dark for all eternity without a body. Ooh. The boy, though, must have been barely conscious, as when his vision came back into focus, he found himself in a beautiful banqueting hall. At the table were many refined-looking men and beautiful women. The table itself was fit to burst. However, no sign of hag meat anywhere. In its place, the surface was covered with fruit and chickens and young turkeys and butter and cakes fresh from the oven and crystal cups of bright red wine. A grand-looking fairy, that the boy judged to be a prince due to his crown. Sit and eat with us. You'll find us most pleasant company. I'm quite sure. The boy, eyeing up a turkey leg, had a thought. I cannot. I see no priest here to bless the food. So thank you, but please allow me to go in peace. The prince smiled. Please, at least taste our wine. I have no doubt it will be the finest you've ever tasted. A lady arose and filled a crystal cup with the deep red wine. Receiving it, the boy could not help but drink the glass dry in one gulp, and sure enough it was the finest he'd ever tasted. No sooner had the boy set the glass back on the table than the fairies began laughing, gently at first. <laughs> But eventually it grew so raucous as to shake the whole building. Ha 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 ha! The lights began to fade, and the boy shook his head to find that he was lying under the haystack that he had fallen asleep under earlier that night. Making his way home, he found the taste of the fairy wine burned throughout his entire body, and for night upon night he was bedridden with a fever. Whenever strong enough to walk, the boy would seek out the fairy kingdom in search of another taste of the fairy wine. But alas, he could never succeed and he died a year to the day that he chose to sleep under that haystack. His name was whispered for years throughout Innisboffin, a warning to all who eat the fairy food or drink the fairy wine, for never more will they know peace or content, or be fit for their work, as in the days before the fairy spell was on them, which brings doom and death to all who fall under the fatal enchantment of its unholy power. Oh. And with that dramatic tale... We will leave you be until the next episode, which will be in two weeks' time. And we'll be talking about um, some theories behind what fairies are, where they come from, some Victorian folk revival stuff. It's going to be kind of fun. Yeah, this, is our, this is our final part on fairies coming up, uh, and we're getting theoretical. Yes. So, uh, we thank you for listening to this episode. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you for everything that's been said on social media so far. We look and listen and appreciate 
everything that said it. It's really nice to uh, have such such kind feedback. And um, yeah, if you have been enjoying it, do make sure, if you'd like to, to follow us on our social medias. We are at gods and goblins on all of them, pretty much. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on SoundCloud, we're on YouTube. (laughs) And if you have been enjoying this, please do, if you would like to, share it with your friends, you know, tell people on the street, just write it on a lamppost. Write it on the roll right stones. Mmm, see, that's that's why you got banned from <laughs> Greater Roll Right, isn't it? That's why you're not allowed to set foot in Roll Right anymore. That's why the druids have been cursing you all these years. <laughs> you can't do it. It's why my fingernails do grow extra long on a full moon, yes. yes. Yeah, it's horrendous. Do not deface any ancient artefacts, but please feel free to deface any modern artefacts. <laughs> Let them know that Cuts and Goblins is a good podcast. <laughs> or... If that's a bit much, we would be very grateful if you were to rate us on iTunes, help us out. Uh, the more people that listen to us, the better, because it's good stuff, I think. It's good stories, even if we're rubbish hosts. So uh, it's all worth doing. Thank you again. If you don't want to do any of that, it's fine. We'll be grateful enough if you just listen again in two weeks' time for another episode of Gods and Goblins. I have been Heather Morehouse, your narrator. And I am innocent of all charges, Hogboy Kieran Hill. Goodbye. Bye! I've cut my own hair, I've dyed my own hair, I've set up the Works Likes fan club. <laughs> If you shut your fucking mouth. (laughs) How dare you? How dare you?